On this episode of Designer Notes, we have access to an exclusive in-depth look at how this chronograph was created. Then, we'll see what happens when a local Arubian viewer sends in his watch for review. Stay tuned for that. And finally, in our viewer segment, you are all not grills. I'm very happy and I'm very proud of all of you. And we are also very opinionated when it comes to watches and we're going to discuss that. All of this in our Designer Notes. I'm going to be straight with all of you, in the most narrative and uh, wholesome way, of course. The only reason why we have an exclusive access to how this watch was designed is simply because I'm the one who designed it. Now, not only is it a very nice and satisfying stroke to my very large and massive ego, it's also a not so subtle way of promoting our watch that we're going to launch and sell worldwide at an affordable price in the next few weeks. Now, many of you are already complaining, and I recognize that, that my watch videos are mostly dishonest and a promotion or a commercial to the brands. Well, there's no more honest and most promotional way at examining a watch than what you're going to see next with this video. And also, this is another not so subtle way of exposing myself to you, of course, in a narrative and wholesome way. Because if it's not obvious as of yet, this really is showing my design piracy because I took all of the great elements from other chronographs and smashed them all together into this one singular dial. Now, you'll be the judge whether it came out good or wrong, but at least you'll find out where I started and how it ended up into this watch in our next blueprint segment on how to design a watch dial for a chronograph. I could still remember the earliest recollection that I have of what a watch would look like. It involved pump pushers, so it's a chronograph. I always love fiddling with things and when it comes to watches, I want them to be functional as well. Sure, a dive bezel would be as functional or even more so in many situations, but to my very simple and immature watch knowledge, a chronograph being used to time something is the most direct function a watch as a timing device should have. You can see the preference in the watch that I sort of spun out using Undone's bespoke service. It's a chronograph, but not really designed by me, just given the design atelier flavor. That's why I was thrilled when I was given the chance to design a watch, and a chronograph was at the top of my list. As a car fan, I love the unique checkered track that reminds me of race tracks that these chronographs were commonly used in. The Speedmaster Mark II had this kind of checkered track, and the Tintin Speedy Pro. I felt it's a distinct but uncommon connection to motorsports. This is the first feature that we locked in in the design phase and everything else was designed around its dimensions. It takes up a significant amount of space, so it was a real challenge to fit everything else inside, including the tachymeter. During the conversation with the manufacturers, we knew this is also a great opportunity to include a beloved feature with such a large real estate on the dial. There were numerous iterations that sort of made the dial busy, and I felt we had to stay true to the spirit of racing. So we decided to stick with a 60 second scale opposed to the normal 12 hour markings. As a designer, it's always a guide for me to ensure that the product can be readily identified or at least express its identity at a glance. This feature accomplishes that. Next, I had to add a hint of my relationship with Adrian who's at the other side of the world, collaborating with me on this project. I felt that making the 30 second marker as large as a 60 which is at the other side of the dial, would be enough of an obscure reference to our relationship while providing the right balance against the subdials. This dictated the choices behind making the logo smaller and removing any semblance of our numerals. We knew we had to stick to the second scale at this point. However, I feel I had to respect the watch enthusiast and add some sort of applied element. I added these chamfered trapezoids to give the dial a pleasing light play. I also trusted the users that they know that these are our markers and these would match the hours and minute hands. Next, I had to determine the type of subdial texture that we could use. The manufacturer had a vast array of choices. But here, I chose the best suitable surface that could match the case that we're going to use, a vintage style case. 
we wanted something that could be used casually and wouldn't be ashamed of using on dressy occasions. And so we went with a radial surface. This surface will be a versatile element on the dial that could easily change its impression with the way it's used on the model and with the user's wrist motion. With each tilt of the wrist, the reflections of light would provide some beautiful visual anchors to enjoy. The weights included on the variants would also play a key role in differentiating them from each other. Three of the dials will have a high contrast theme with one being colored in the same hue as the dial. This gives the blue model a totally different personality while remaining in the same collection. Two of the dials are designed to have a larger imprint than the other two. This was achieved by coloring the track similar to the dial's palette. The other two had a more prominent seconds hand track with its high contrast configuration. Lastly, it's time to show off its hidden feature of the dial. We went back and forth with the manufacturers and knew we could focus on a great feature microbrand lovers would certainly have fun with. Our producers have an excellent track record when it comes to materials development. They use the same materials the Tissot and Swatch Group is using and we applied that to our luminous paint. We asked the manufacturers to apply 7 coats of paint on the areas that we have the most white print, the checkered track. This would provide a fantastic effect in low light conditions. Each dial has a distinct appeal. The bronze model has the least loom, fitting its role as the dressiest option of the four. The silver model, on the other hand, undergoes a transformation. Its seemingly full light dial transitions into a ring of loom when viewed in the dark. The other two not only display a loom ring, but also showcases the tachymeter scale. We hope that fans of vintage motorsports watches will love these cool new releases. But at the very least, it's an exercise in design application and progress in the hobby. And that is the 6030 Chronograph from Horology Story and Design Atelier. You know the drill, you've heard of it before. We're very happy about this product and how it turned out. We're very excited to offer it to you at a very affordable price and it took many months to develop, etc, etc, etc. But what's more important for this designer is that I'm now able to share what's going on in my demented head. Whether that's aggravating or pleasant is greatly debatable and up to you. But nevertheless, it is my blueprint of how to design a chronograph dial. Now, as customary with our show, it's time to give some airtime for our sponsor, Kunuku Coffee Roasters. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more generous to you today, and we're just simply going to stare at this bag, and hopefully you'll be able to sniff that very nice roasted aroma from your screen up to your nose and into your brain. I know that's going to happen, that's been happening to me all this time. Kunuku Coffee Roasters. While we're in a local mood, recently a local viewer here in Aruba had the guts and the bravery to send in one of their watches for us to review. I don't know if they're not aware that whenever something is sent into this household, if I don't shoot it immediately, my wife will wear that watch and that watch will then be in great peril, in so much danger that it's always a battle against time to rescue that watch and send it back to its owner. But I'm happy to report that this watch is not in this household anymore. It's safely away from my wife's clutches and it's back to its owner in one piece. Or should I say, many pieces. This video is brought to you by Anna Raw. The watch collecting culture is a deep and multi-nuanced social avenue of horology that I am severely underqualified to eloquently educate you on. Let me illustrate it in three levels. For weather-beaten surf and turf lovers like us, it is worth the look if a watch is under the $500 mark. Anything approaching the two grand and you leave it up to the entry-level bar brawlers. 
But then, there's the upper-class fleet admirals that owns the so-called autorologies and eyepieces. Those are the three types of watch fans that this brand is trying to cater to with this one collection. Sar Vomba, a mid-tier watch brand named after a destructive device, took many of the features of a hype watch and applied it in a constructive way. They designed these to look like they could be worn by the big boys who are often wearing these often obnoxious and loud watches. However, because of their equally obnoxious and loud lifestyle, they tend to get away with it. You know, because absurdity is drowned out by even more absurdity after all. And now, these great features are offered to the two lower classes at a very reasonable price. This sounds attractive and even innovative. However, Sarbomba had to resort to some obnoxious means to achieve this desired effect. It's a secret so divisive that it could actually drive away some potential customers. This TB8218 offers one of the widest range of readily available parts on a microbrand watch. We should still consider them as a microbrand given that their operation and notoriety has not yet been mainstream. With watch features like these though and this kind of timepiece, it's only a matter of time until they reach critical mass in popularity. Allow me to justify that overstatement. On average, a Zelos watch will set you back $400. Buy three pieces from this microbrand powerhouse and you've already crossed the $1,000 mark with a solid three watch collection. For about the same price, you can get this whole combo set that would yield you 2,400 unique combinations just from the strap and bezel alone. I've bought a G-Shock more expensive than this set and this set undoubtedly has that G-Shock feel as the Japanese brand is famously known for their bezel and strap swapping. Now Sarbomba is trying to weaponize this for the microbrand market. But unlike many G-Shock parts, these components offered by the TB8218 has a premium impression and feel to it. In fact, they are using practically the same strap material that's used on a Richard meal. But that's saying more about RM than anything else though. From here, it may seem so easy to mix and match these parts together. But then again, it really is. The crown is loosely screwed in, the straps will come off with a push of a button from underneath, and the bezel is disengaged by simultaneously pressing the crown and the sign button on the other side of the case. You're literally buying a full collection for a price of two automatic TSO PRXs. With that said, this watch caters to all three watch fan types, the microband boys, the entry-level crowd, and even the producer Michael types. You can even get another module and custom choose the pieces you want on their website. However, this is not the first microbrand that tried to offer that RM impression to the commoners like us. Sarbomba chose the slimmer type of RM to replicate though. Beside this piece from Alto 8, the difference in profile volume is clearly apparent. It uses about the same automatic module as these are chosen more for their value rather than an area to write or talk about. They also use the same kind of soft molded rubber with adequately signed buckles to complete their impersonation of the hype watch. On the legibility side, you could argue that Alto 8's dial is a bit more readable. But really, both watches were never really marketed for practicality nor functionality in the first place. Up close, there is a sheer overwhelming amount of detail on the dial that becomes the showpiece of the design. From here though, if you're perceptive enough, you can work out this watch's secret that it doesn't want you to take notice. They would love you to put your attention on the bezel and strap and even down to the buckle that has its own release mechanism. Remember, this set has a rose gold and black IP coated hardware as well. The level of finishing on some of the buttons are very admirable. It all snaps into place nicely and works with the design. The crown is a great point of interest with all of its angular groups. This is a multifunctional crown that works on tandem with the side button. The crown sleeve is secured only by the treading inside that goes along with the winding direction and remarkably stays in place all the time. It may take some practice to unscrew the sleeve though. Pressing both the crown and side buttons will unclamp the bezel and it's secured with only two rounded clips.
the bezel snaps into place with a satisfying click. What's also satisfying is the amount of light play that you get. All of the gears in the dial are radial finish breeding a seeming life to each gear. These along with the chamfered bridges create a deep dimensionality to the watch. This comes at a great cost though. These gears are just for show. A facade meant to hide the very plain movement behind it. Those with a passing knowledge of watches won't mind these features at all. But if you're half serious about the hobby, you cannot deny that this is at the very least off-putting. Some may even view it as downright deceptive. But here's the thing, if you could step back and tell yourself that watches are visual accessories anyway, then this thing is such a fun watch to own. It's really not dissimilar to Legos where the fun is in building and showing off rather than in creating something that's of any use. And that's neither right or wrong, it's just how you wear your watches. Sure, you can always wish that those gears were actually functional, but then again, why not wish for a Rolls Royce or an actual RM while you're at it? As a watch pirate that has thrown away every sense of social respect when I stereotype guys who own high pieces as possessing an obnoxious demeanor, I have an unwarranted advice. Obviously, you can always man up, and you don't have to be that obnoxious. And neither should you spend ridiculous money on one of those high pieces. Then the TV8218 might be a reasonable wish that could actually come true. And that is the Sarbomba brought to you by Mr. Enorob. It was very nice and it's a high quality fun piece that we had for the uh, past few days. And even the guys in the office were having a blast seeing me wear that Sarbomba. Thank you once again to Mr. Enorob and hopefully we'll see more of his watches in the channel. And now it's time to see your viewer comments. Okay, let's begin with some comments on the AI assisted, not designed, AI assisted G-Shock. Um, I'm still yet to see any live videos of it. Maybe there's some that is existing out there, but um, you had some very strong opinions about it. Jimmy Kincaid says, AI is so stupid. If I wore that watch to lunch, just once, all those holes would be filled with burrito drippings. If I wore it to work, it would be filled with grease and dirt. That's so impractical. If you just left it sitting in its box, the holes would just collect dust. Who at Casio would green light this tripobic nightmare? Tripobic nightmare, okay, I don't, I don't know what that means. But, okay, Jimmy Kincaid has some really valid points there those holes will gather dust but quite frankly if there's anyone who's going to own this watch it's probably those collectors that's going to keep it into the safe and have it as a collection uh, showcase or a piece that they would just use to as a bargaining chip to any other piece that they would love in their near future and i think they should be able to afford a dustless or a vacuum sealed display case for that but that is the most impractical one of the most impractical g-shocks that you'll ever find because even if this remember that seventy thousand dollar g-shock pure solid gold g-shock square that was released back in the 35th anniversary was it 35th i think it was 30, 35th anniversary that was still wearable. You could wear that and nobody would uh, know the wiser. And Jimmy Kincaid is right here. Also, Steve Moreno also commented about the Invicta. Andy Forward also said it's hideous. One interesting comment here that uh, I wanted to highlight is that of Dobilo Ru. And he said, this is the first mechanical Casio, right? Well, I did some some digging 
it's not really the first mechanical Casio and this quite frankly may not be mechanical in the sense that how we categorize them because in horror in, in the watch community we often say mechanical to watch that are purely mechanical and not assisted by quartz even the Grand Seiko um, even the Grand Seiko movements that have a quartz oscillator is oftentimes still considered as quartz rather than mechanical so if a watch contains some sort of semblance or some sort of feature that has quartz in it it's most likely being categorized as quartz and everything else mechanical is mechanical or automatic this one is or this one seems to have some mechanical parts to it not so dissimilar to the VK uh, movements from uh, Seiko remember those uh, the like this one this quartz uh, chronograph it has a quartz heart so to speak but it has a mechanical module on top that activates or that that facilitates the chronograph hand so that's why when you press it it feels satisfying because it has that mechanical click because it does have some mechanical parts in it but the power source is a battery that has a quartz oscillator inside so hopefully that clears things up this still has some sort of quartz nest to it especially with the solar uh, feature that it has so it is not a mechanical watch as as watch guys would categorize it to be next we go to some of your youtube shorts um, comments there are quite a bit of shorts comments because i'm still debating whether to make some youtube shorts replies to actual youtube shorts so might as well highlight some of your comments here while we're at it one thing that i was interested in diving into is what shaswat shukla 10 says what are you doing man i love your content but comparing seiko 5 with the prx it's like apples and oranges don't justify the misses on a half budget watch just don't and yes you may ban me from the channel i will use another id to watch that content okay well i'm <laughs> i'm not really banning you from the channel you know even though i say so you're banned from the channel i'm not really banning you so it's really just my pirate mess um, seeping off me there but you're banned from humanity for trying to coerce me to ban you from the channel and yes you can use other um, youtube ids for that but you're banned from humanity to infinity okay but here's the thing comparing that Sega 5 to the prx is apples and oranges yes it is and let's be honest there that is true i actually agree with him it is kind of like apples to oranges but you cannot deny when you're shopping for watches those two things come up even if it's vastly different price points depending on the prx model or model that you're looking after because there's like such a wide range from so from 400 to 700 that's the same prx compared to the Seiko 5 that's at what $500 or so we just smack that in the middle so it's still a comparison for comparison's sake and I'm not against that and I think many of you enjoy that or many of you entertain that comparison because let's be honest you are comparing those things when you're when you have that budget of under a thousand dollars you are comp looking at Seiko 5s so you're looking at the pair X you're looking at the citizens so you're looking at the Alpinist if there's he's been still an Alpinist that's below a thousand dollars those are the things that you you consider right moon swatch too but the moon swatch I am not so fond of anymore maybe I'll do another one of that video but without the moon swatch because it's I'm not so keen on having the moon swatch in that uh, conversation anymore okay bubble bubble raft says i wore both the rose gold versions and the of the gm21 
hundred and the GMW B five thousand. The Casio was more brown than pinkish of the five thousand. I prefer the look of the copper Casio over the gold Casio and the pinkish GMW B five thousand. But I'd rather have. A, but it's rather bad if you want to use the digital functions uh, due to the bad negative display. Uh, for the price, they should. Uh, that standard uh, display. I think that's what he, he, he meant there with the STN. Um, I'm still... Oh, I guess it depends on how you use your, your Casios. Many of you probably fidget with it. They, you, you, you click on the buttons. You see how uh, the functions... And yes, you use it as a stopwatch. But for the Casio Oak... I, I've never used the Casio Oak as a stopwatch. So I guess it's really just for show and just telling the hours and minutes so i don't mind that negative display but going back to his comment the copper or the rose gold casio is really more copper or brownish than the rose or pink gold of the uh, full of the full metal uh, square but i think that's also another way of, of casio or g-shock uh, releasing these uh, color models for sure there's going to be a real pink gold model of uh, the Casio and I think that would be a little bit more desirable um, to me I didn't like the, the brownish um, copper tone of that uh, Casio but yeah everyone has a preference J.E. Biza also said Yellow gold is hard to pull off on light skin. I am European niche. You, you. Is that even a word? European niche? So you're kind of European, but not kind of European. Anyway. But my Latin friends comment about me being darker than all of them, and I feel like yellow gold looks strange on my wrist. One of my Casio Oak offshores offshores in quote unquote I assume this is a modded version is black strap with the rose gold bezel and I think it looks great well that is I've heard of that before that certain darker toned skin would have gold or yellow gold appear much better than rose gold on them but I tend to disagree on that anything that has a warmish tone on it, whether it's gold or yellow, can be pulled off on darker skin. A darker skin, really, because it has such a contrast between the yellow and the rose gold metal onto the skin. That's why it looks more appealing. But on lighter skin like mine, it doesn't have that much of a contrast, if, if you catch what I'm trying to say here. And especially when light bounces off it, my light skin with that light would virtually melt into my skin, that, that kind of uh, metal color. And so that there is a, a certain visual appeal to that. That's why uh, many, even, even jewelers, would suggest that for lighter skin, uh, they, you, you would rather go with a darker, uh, much more contrast ready um, accessory uh, or, or, or jewelry and this kind of has that sort of, uh, of sense but ultimately these G-Shocks you wear what you want to wear and uh, confidently show yourself among other people that often uh, gets the attention rather than the accessory and it becomes really just an accessory to, to you who's the actual person that's wearing it and um, but there's some some science there if you if you say so Nizer Mirror is back and he's been commenting a lot in our videos but most of the time he's commenting on where is the Venezianico review I just, so for Nizar again thank you so much for supporting the channel and always commenting i love that we always love uh, i always love to interact with you and i love your enthusiasm when it comes to benicianico and yes benicianico is still uh sending their watches to me they're just really busy they've been all all around the place uh, just like uh, peter also of nomadic they've been all over the place with so many watch 
uh, events going on and they've been flying all, all over these uh, countries. Um, Venetianico was recently in the United States, uh, also is um, Peter of Nomadic. And they are sending their watches in uh, for us to review and we're excited to review that. And also, I'm trying to keep up with all of these watch uh, reviews, so hopefully you stay tuned with that. I still have the, the Guzman uh, on the back burner, and I've already shot many of the footages. I just need to get to them to edit them. And I'm still busy with many more um, projects, many more watch designs, so stay tuned for that as well. Uh, watch, watches with Dennis says, I agree with the indices are not required to qualify as a watch or timepiece. That said, I'm not a fan of watch designs that skew, that eschew uh, indices. I expect a bit of precision from my watches, and I think if I were in the mood for something that doesn't need a level of precise time telling, that I'd want something more whimsical and less minimalistic, like a one-handed watch from Meister Singer. Okay, I, I get his point, and. That is a valid reason to have indices. You, you still want a measure of accuracy and maybe even semblance of a, a watch on on your watch. Because without the indices, it just looks so minimalistic and more fashion heavy. And um, that is a valid point to have those indices. At the very least, click on every minute of the, the watch. Um, but having a whimsical approach, I guess this is where me and Watch Dennis has a vari uh, variance of opinion. I would rather go with a minimalist and reserved design rather than a whimsical approach. Say, for example, having Mickey Mouse hands or something on your on your dial. Uh, I, I, it would really be working against my taste if a watch did that unless it's a cultural it has a cultural touchstone say for example that uh was it who's that um that uh, creator um that metal gear solid watch i forgot the, the creator's uh, name but anyway i'll just put it on the screen he created a really nice mecha themed watch and they and I want that kind of watch because it hits me on a diff totally different level because of my nostalgia for Metal Gear Solid and maybe for Gundams and mech design and I'm, I'm actually planning to make a mech themed watch and hopefully we'll get that approved uh, in the near future especially now that I've, we've started to dive our toes or dip our toes not dive but dip our toes into watch creation hopefully that's another thing that we can help materialize in the near future and now for your CW comments I love that you guys commented and interacted a lot with the uh, Christopher Ward at all that I reviewed recently and I wasn't expecting that and um, I guess many of you are much more engaged with our uh, channel than I was um, expecting but here there are still some of course aside from the krill comments anyone I, I love that it's, it's a thing now we'll make that a thing I, I if I had my way, I would like make a t-shirt, not a krill, and that would be a thing that, that, that we could do. But I love the interaction, and I welcome all of your comments, even some that are uh, insulting <laughs> or, or attacking me with your words. But let's be honest, nobody could attack me, anyone with letters, but yes, it can be hurtful still. But nevertheless, I love the interaction that you uh, showed when it comes to uh, this watch and the somewhat uh, semblance of writing that I put in to these um, these uh, videos. So everyone who's not a Krill, uh, I'm very happy to uh, acknowledge you. Let's, let's try and acknowledge everyone at the very least who said that. Um, Ray Ray, of course, is back. And he, rather than commenting on the Krills, he rather 
comment on the holes at on the atolls. Okay, don't be an atoll, be the wiser words. Uh, uh, from Joseph Marucci. Okay. Um, Dan Schlax says his favorite atoll is the bikini atoll. Yes, of course. Very juvenile of you, uh, Dan Schlax. I've had my eye on the watch. Uh, Graham Wallace says I've had an eye on a watch for a few weeks and was wondering what I what it looked like on an orange strap. As opposed to the C63 Sealander, which has an orange accent on the white face. Thanks for the review. I love this watch, but now I'm even more confused about which model I'd prefer. Uh, well, that's the sad double edged sword that we all have to contend with when it comes to. Oh, wait. I need to pick up my wife. <laughs> I need to pick up my wife. Okay, that's a quick hot second. I totally forgot I need to pick up my my wife. Well, I survived that ordeal. Now, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I asked all of you in a YouTube post to give me some suggestions of would you rather do have this watch or this watch? But apparently, you guys misunderstood that. The, the examples that I gave are the ones that I'm asking you and then you answer you answered me on those would you rather would I rather be uh, choosing Rolex or Omega and some of you actually answered there which is an interesting answer in itself even though it's the totally wrong idea that you guys um, thought about what I was asking maybe I wasn't asking so clearly but anyway Mr. Shinobi says Jason would rather an Omega would rather a bracelet and would rather see the cat go up in flames. Amazingly, Mr. Shinobi there is right and correct. I would actually choose Omega instead of Rolex. Yes, there are certain Rolex that I find attractive, but as a whole, when it comes to their collections and the watches that they're releasing, I would veer. Uh, more in the side of Omega. I find Omega is doing a lot more interesting things with their watches. They're more often ready to innovate and they're more likely to take risks. But that's not a knock at Rolex. I know Rolex has been a powerhouse for decades, but that's my preference. Also, I would rather prefer a bracelet as well. I love me a good bracelet and Mr. Shinobi there is right. And yes, of course, cats should go up in flames all the time. There's some other remarks about that. Dr. Bob's nightmare said, let the dog take care of the cat. Yes, I wholeheartedly 1000% agree. Then there's others who suggested something else, which actually I think got the idea in the first place. Like uh, JW Florida says here that would I rather have uh, Ball or ZRC? I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't look up ZRC ahead of time. What's a ZRC? ZRC watch. Let's look at that. ZRC. Oh, actually, ZRC is like very really nice. But um, he gave a few suggestions here Ball, ZRC, Zelos, uh, Squale. Christopher Ward Titaniums after the logo change shooter. Okay, so let's rank all of those uh, together uh, in JW Florida's um, list. I would go with the very top. I'd probably go with Zelos. Uh, that's a pretty obvious uh, choice there. I think Zelos has a lot of very interesting and uh, affordable micro brand watches. Uh, if Christopher Ward was a little bit more affordable, then they may have overtaken uh, Zelos in my category there. But Zelos takes the top. I'd probably go Christopher Ward the second. Then ZRC is quite interesting to me. I like the, their designs, their bullhead designs. I like also the uh, way that they build their uh, dials. And they have so many different configurations as well. This is an interesting uh, watch brand. I would uh, just at first glance, I would uh, take that. Then I would take uh, probably 
uh, tutor. I like me some good tutor also. I I find that certain tutors now tend to be a little bit more boring compared to the tastes that I am seeing compared to the other watches that I've been seeing. But tutor also takes the cake over Squally and over Ball. Ball is uh, just too boring for me. I, I I don't know. I can't seem to love any Ball watches. I would rather go Bell and Ross than Ball. In, in fact, sorry Ball, but. Even if you give me money, it would be very hard. Well, of course. If you give me money, yes, then I would review ball watches. But very unlikely. Okay, so before we move on, move on with that, I would like you to send me some suggestions for watch fights, like Rolex versus Omega or like uh, the Black Bay 58 versus the Zelos um, Hammerhead or something like that. What would I rather pick? Show me or, or just give me two watches that you think would be an interesting take for me to, to pick. It doesn't have to be related to each other. It doesn't have to be two dive watches. It doesn't have to be two pilot watches. Just give me two watches and ask me which I would rather pick. Whether it's a quartz or, or automatic, uh, whatever it may be. It doesn't even have to be the same price point either. It's a, a, a way for me to interact with you and something that we could talk about. And yeah, maybe you could pick my brain and why what I'm thinking uh, regarding those kind of choices. Now, uh, wait, I was supposed to, when I went away, I was supposed to answer a question. Uh, oh yeah, about that watch dilemma. Yes, that's the dilemma when it comes to reviewing and watching watches in the internet. Instead of making you decide, well, some of some of you already commented and replied to me that because of my videos, you were able to make a decision regarding certain watch uh, choices. But that also goes the other way around. Sometimes. Because now you have understood certain details that you weren't uh, aware of before, it makes the decision even harder. But ultimately, guys, this channel is mostly maybe 98% um, a men's channel. Men like watch our channel. Of course, there are some not really nice ladies out there that's also watching our channel. I'm pretty proud of that. Maybe there's like three of you out there that still subscribe to my channel. But this channel is predominantly a male channel make up your mind it's easy to make up your mind guys it's just that we become so confused because there's so many choices so narrow down those choices see what you really want even if it's not practical whatever you would enjoy because these watches they're never practical in the first place believe me i have a watch on and when somebody asked me the time i would still pull out my iphone or even look at my microwave, even though we don't have a microwave. Or even my... No, our refrigerator doesn't have a, a clock on it. But nevertheless, you get my point, right? Get the job done, get the choice chosen, get it over with. Now, going back to the Krill comments. Okay, let's go back to the Krill comments. There are some really good comments here, like this. Ned Flanders. It's been a while since we've heard of Ned Flanders. And he said, your channel is grilling it. Yes, these are the kind of mature comments that this channel is built around with. You know, the foundation of this watch piracy channel is built under the rubble of people with such uh, immature jokes. That's mostly dad jokes and uh, showing your age and you know it would have been okay but then Ned Flanders still has after weeks uh, how many days uh, after weeks it still has he still has this um, cat avatar so because of that cat avatar Ned Flanders even though you're grilling it also in your comments you're banned from grilling it and finally Mr. Zillos huh And that's the longest comment of Mr. Zillow's today. 
I don't, I don't even know if that's how, uh, the, if that's the tone that he would ask that. But yes, he was confused because I suddenly uploaded a Tagalog version of the De Guzman review. And um, I promised De Guzman, I promised you all that when we got that um, watch for review that I'm going to make two versions, the English and the Tagalog version. And then uh, after that, we'll see if it'll pick up. Right now, it's not uh, being watched. It's not being viewed. Uh, uh, not, I don't think it's even a thousand views yet, but it was fun doing that review in Tagalog. And um, even if it's still a small sample size, even though it garners less views, let me know if you still want me to make those Tagalog uh, videos. But there's still one more that's coming up. I uh, still need to review the DG013, which is still amazing. I, I really, really want to start working on that, but I'm extremely busy at the moment. But after that review, I'm going to translate that also into a Tagalog version. So, suffer a little bit more, suffer one more time, my dear Grills, as uh, you have proven yourselves to be not just obedient sea creatures, but at the same time, wa discerning watch pirates. And I'm really, really proud of you, proud of the interaction that you're doing. Yes. Please do so. Please continue with the interaction. And I still try to interact with your YouTube shorts. Whenever I get that coffee break, uh, I do those uh, little short one minute reactions to your comments. And maybe next time we could react to other people's comments on other channels. What do you think? Let me know. Comment down below. Let's discuss. As always, go Krillin. Well, who knows? Uh, well, comment down below. Give me some suggestions on uh, how to continue to build this. Uh, well, who knows? Comment down below. Let me know what you... And that's the end of our show. Thank you so much for uh, staying uh, till the end of this show. If there's any suggestions that you want to say, just comment down below or shoot me an email. That's fine too. I read each and every one of them because I have no life and I uh, want to be a sadistic pirate captain torturing myself with all of your nonsensical comments and grilling announcements and uh, announcements.